The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. The Investment Fix Podcast. Tune in today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. The fold in Mahine called Duncan Breve talking uh, My guest today is Brian Wilmot. He's the CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer of Stake. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Stake. And honestly, I'm super into it. It's what we're talking about here is investing culture. And I can understand how that, you know, some people hearing that might go, oh, that's, you know, how is that? Is that a fold subject? And it is. Because, and and the the conversation really kind of addresses that. Like, I, I, I've been a you know, I'm a, as as anyone who's listened to this podcast for a while will know. I'm like a bit long term subscriber to the Economist and to Big Business Week, and I I find the writing around um, business investing, finance, and the way that you can see through that into culture, into politics, into policy. I've always found that really fascinating and, you know, growing up, I, you know, I always loved Michael Lewis as, as an author who you know, came out of Wall Street, has written brilliant books about culture and sports, but also about business. And, and yet it always felt out of reach. Like, what do you do with that knowledge, with that information? Um, and what, you know, companies like Stake have done is allow you to kind of you know, when you see and feel something in terms of the way that the sort of culture of the world is changing, the way, you know, behaviours are changing um, as they have just so radically over the past 20 years. You know, the biggest companies in the world right now, Microsoft, Apple, Google, you know, Facebook, these are all in the 10 largest companies in the world. With the exception of Microsoft, none of them would have been, you know, Amazon, that they'd all been laughed out of the room um, 20 years ago, and yet now they've upended the world. And as a you know person of a certain age who was really paying attention, I could feel that coming a long way off. And I wanted I, I wasn't necessarily like in love with the world that they were making, but I knew it was coming, and I had nothing I could do with it. And that was kind of that kind of gnawed at me for a while. And and then with the arrival of these platforms, there is this way that you can kind of back your intuition and what you're seeing, feeling your own behaviors about how the the world is evolving and the, the companies that are remaking it for better or worse. And what Stake does, which I think is what distinguishes and it and, and what, what you know, Brian and I spend the majority of this conversation talking about is it writes about, it creates content that wraps around this idea of the intersection of um, sort of culture, society, kind of st- structure on thematic shifts and and investing and and about this like idea that there's a whole bunch of people who are going to tell you that you shouldn't do this, that you should leave it to the professionals. They're typically the professionals and there's an argument to be made there. But what we talk about is, you know, on a long-term basis, you know, they might be right, you might be right. It, but... And no one's suggesting that you put your whole, you know, every dollar you earn into a stake account and and uh, sort of figure it out. But the, this idea that you have an amount that's yours and where you can kind of play with and and kind of um, just start to learn about how the market responds to the to the world as it's changing, I really think there's something in it. And I think it's not just a kind of COVID meme stocks, Wall Street bets, flash in the pan. I think it is like a it is a, almost like a new form of culture that's emerging in front of us. It won't be for everyone. There's a lot of people, you know, who are, you know, find the idea of investing, you know, just getting too close to the the fire of, um, you know, of capitalism. But we're all investors. Like we all have KiwiSaver. This is just a kind of a different way of doing it. And as certain of the, the kind of old charities, we talk about this as well, like, you know, Buying a house just isn't the kind of logical given thing that it that it once was generationally. Like it's so to have 
a different thing that you hold, that you tend to, that's your own, that's this portfolio that you can have with a company like Stake. I, I, I don't know, personally, I feel like there's a lot in it. This is really the substance of the conversation. Um, so we talk about using the Barbie movie as an example and the, the strategy that, that drove that from Mattel, you know, thinking the, the, this, this idea that they're actually not a toy company, they're an IP company. And, and there's a bunch more examples like that. Uh, so, yeah, it's a bit of an unconventional episode. It is brought to you in partnership with Stake. This was also one of the most fun and energizing conversations I've had on the fold in a while. So, um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. This is uh, Brian Wilmot, CMO of Stake on the fold. Kia ora, Brian. Welcome to the fold. Kia ora. Duncan, how are you? Very good, very good. Uh, you know, great, great to have you over here to, to, to talk about Stake. I, I wondered if you could start out by talking about sort of where it sits in the market, like how, how you conceive of it and position it differently versus other uh, online investing platforms. Yeah, absolutely. So Stake is, we like to see it as where ambitious Kiwis invest. Um, so what that sort of means or in a practical sense, how we enable that is Stake is a share investing platform that offers the best access to the US. Um, there's obviously a number of options out there from an investing platform perspective, but where we sort of position differently has been, I think from the start, the conception of our investor base or our customer base, um, the investors on the platform. We've always taken a bit of a stance of looking for or targeting the more actively engaged investor. I think if you look at the broad strokes of all the different types of investors out there, you've got people that are high frequency, you know, super sophisticated traders um, that know the ins and outs are very technical. And then you've got sort of beginners, um, punters that might just be in it for a quick buck. We sort of sit in the middle of that where we want people that um, aren't necessarily the most sophisticated traders that need all the detail in the world, um, but have this actively engaged mindset where they actually want to learn about the markets and they want to grow their wealth over the long term and they want to be in it for the long term. So we're not looking for the quick fire, uh, quick buck type investor. And we're positioned really around that mindset of this is a tool that I know that I can use to build my wealth over time. And as a result of that, probably the key difference in the way that we think about the stake brand experience, whether that's the product itself comms or content is we actually try to take people deeper into the market and bring to life the dynamism and the interest that is there in all facets of you know the market and the investing experience as opposed to sort of dislocate the markets from the user experience and make it feel like so unintimidating that you're not actually even being a participant you just have your money sitting somewhere and you're not really sure what's going on. Yeah, I mean, and I actually want to talk about the content side in a bit because I think that you guys do it in a really you know, you, you build that bridge really well in a way that I think starts your mind thinking about more critically about how mm. you, you know, there's, there's actually investment opportunities or information around you at all times. And I yeah. think that's one thing that you do really well. I wondered, but before then, do you, do you have a sense of what, like a, the profile of a typical state customer beyond that, that sort of market segment piece, but like, you know, is there a sort of generationally defined um, uh, profile uh, that, that you have? Yeah, as we've grown, we've obviously recruited a broader sweep of of investors across, you know, the countries that we're in, in New Zealand in particular. Um, but the sort of bullseye, I would say, is the next generation of investor, as we often refer to them as. So it's kind of like an under 40s. Um, but it's a, it's a young professional, um, ambitious, working their way up their career and looking to really grow their wealth um, and take – that sense of progress into their own hands and, and have that sense of control over managing their own, their own progress and their own way forward. So it certainly is a, as a younger profile. It's not like 18 year olds. It's not 20 year olds as the bullseye. We of course have some of them on the platform. It's really kind of the 35 year old is the median age um, on the platform. And it's that young professional earning a decent wage and really just looking to accelerate their wealth generation. Cause it's such a new thing to, to be able to conceive of this. Like I remember, 10 or 15 years ago, I was like messing around on like Investopedia and started to mm. build a little mock portfolio because there was just no way to directly go into the US market. Mm. And yet it felt like all of the energy and innovation in terms of, you know, the, the sort of companies that were reshaping the world were coming out of there and you were, they were sort of, you could feel them, but you couldn't kind of touch them in that respect. Mm. And I think that that sort of direct to consumer or that 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 level of access that's provided by by companies like Stake is is quite a profound shift for you know the the traditional mindset of a New Zealand um, investor it was previously a property investor mm. 
then it became KiwiSaver, which is you know the definition of uh, passive. What what you know in terms of that that sort of next generation. You know, obviously, you, you launched here in 2020. You had this um, this huge boom through mm. through COVID. Is that sustaining? And how, you know, what what do you see as the kind of scale of the opportunity for that 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 sort of customer mindset here? For sure. So certainly, see it maintaining. I think we've sort of come out of that peak COVID hysteria um, and the sort of inverted commas retail investing boom or the or the the beginnings of it. Um, and we've seen it maintained. People are in it for the long term. I think the media initially sort of typecast this generation of investors and retail investors as, you know, reckless and not in it for the long term and don't know what they're doing. And as soon as the market turns, you know, thing they're going to flee. It was gonna, a very kind of patronizing sort very of patronizing. Uh, conception. It's a bit I of felt. a look down the nose. At, like you guys don't know what you're doing. Um, leave, it, leave it to the pros. Kind yeah, of which, thing. which kind of always seems to be the case when like a new generation comes and invades. Um, you know, Any cultural a, a, space, an right? established cultural space. Um, so definitely we're seeing it maintain. And I think that's a result of it. It wasn't just COVID and it wasn't just, you know, people had some cash and they were going to invest. I think that was maybe the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of actually opening the floodgates for people to come into the market. What we've seen through doing a lot of customer research and speaking to customers and people that are investing on the platform, whether with sake or sort of broadly in the market, is that really it's sort of a, as a result of a, a, a shift in the 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 sort of macro environment that this generation grew up in. So if you think back 30, 40 years, um, the sense of progress or how you would mark your progress going forward was very linear or very sort of clear cut. So you would get a university degree or, you know, fewer people back then would get university degrees as such that would pretty much guarantee you a job in the space that you wanted to get a job in. You'd work in that job, work your way up sort of the corporate ladder. You'd maybe move companies a couple of times, but the sort of bouncing around between different career spaces and job types wasn't really commonplace. It was it was much more linear. You'd get married, you'd have kids, and to your point, you'd get into the property market and you'd start to generate your wealth off the back of that. So it was very clear cut in terms of the mold of how to grow wealth over time. You then look at this generation, um, university degrees are completely commoditized, for example. Um, I, I think it was 10, sorry, one in 10 30 years ago, people had university degrees. Now it's closer to one in three um, so it's much more commoditized. So that guarantee of I'm going to get the job in the space that I want is just not a thing anymore. It's it's sort of entry ticket. It's like if you don't have a degree, you're not even looked at. Um, but it certainly doesn't guarantee you the employment. Then that corporate ladder climbing is n- definitely not as linear as linear as it used to be. People are jumping between career types. So they're going from being someone in finance to being someone in design, and they're they're searching for sort of what really makes them tick. Well, yeah, and, and not only that, right, like, and this is where the investor piece comes in, is like the, the kind of sureties of the old kind of corporate era where, you know, there were a, a, a big corporation would mm. sort of own a particular piece of the sort of business real estate and it could kind of sit there largely unencumbered for mm. decades. A lot of the energy over the last 20 years has been firms that are directly trying to disrupt that and that is actually... Yeah, so you're kind of investing in the the sort of much more chaotic, fluid landscape yeah. that is what you're witnessing out in the world as a young professional. Yeah, exactly. And you're sort of seeing in terms of that chaotic landscape, it's basically the bottom line is that it's just far harder to progress financially or, or generally forward. It's far harder to have the world cut that out for you. And so what people are doing, the reaction to that is saying, it's well, it needs to be up to me. I need to take back control and I need to take ownership of my own progress and within financial, um, you know, personal finances, that's very prevalent. And so this idea of, okay, I need to learn how to invest. I need to learn how to generate wealth is a reaction to just the way the world is working for this generation. And so COVID sort of hit. And as I say, that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back in that, you know, there was a spotlight on the markets. They were highly volatile and actually they crashed and then continued to boom. Um, people had extra money that they weren't spending because they weren't going out and they had extra time because they were sitting at home. And so really that was the maybe the catalyst that opened the floodgates, as I say, but the, the concept and the mentality behind why people want to invest and, and be actively engaged in the market is because they need to go and take control over wealth generation. And so for that reason, it, we're not seeing it as a flash in the pan. We're not seeing it as just a thing that happened for a couple of years during COVID. We're seeing it as this sort of s- systemic shift in the way that people are engaging with their personal finances. Just on COVID, because like I, I totally agree with everything you're saying, and yet that moment mm. was extraordinary. And for some fault for a, a young company that has, was just sort of trying to figure out its way in the world yeah. to have that happen, 
what was it like to to be inside it at that time to kind of to sort of see because we yeah you know, I've I've read a bunch about it and mm. and you know the the kind of Wall Street bets meme stocks phenomena you know they were they were huge global news stories but you yeah. could actually watch it yeah I mean it was fascinating couple of years absolutely so um, obviously we'd been in market and we'd been growing a customer base before COVID actually hit so we would, you know we were always around for investors looking for access to Wall Street. Um, and wanting sort of that exposure to that market. And then, but yes, COVID was an accelerant to the business in terms of customer acquisition and obviously just general commercial growth. Um, it was very, it was very fun. It was very exciting. Like you're seeing you, for things, when things are good, it's like everything that you try kind of what you think is kind of working. And yeah. it's kind of one of those moments where you're just like doing different things and you're doing PR and you're doing all these things from a marketing perspective and you're developing new product and you're just growing and it's really exciting. The team's growing. You're building HR departments and legal departments and customer numbers are growing. So it's really exciting. But I think what we really tried to do was stay focused on who we were for before the boom happened. As in what is that concept around the, the psyche of the customer or, or who that bullseye is from a mentality perspective, as I said, that person who is actively engaged and whether they're brand new to market or they've been investing for five or ten years – the, the, the unifying factor is that they actually want to be in there and do it for the long term and build their wealth. And so we really tried to stay focused on delivering for that customer from a you know communications perspective or when we went you know above the line in advertising all the way through to how we designed the product and the types of products that we brought to market. And I think that held us in good stead to actually have sustainable growth and attract the right customers through that boom because certainly – broadly the category and of course stake as, as being a participant in that category recruited customers that were, were not in it for the right reasons they were seeing oh tesla's gone crazy and my friend told me at a barbecue so i just want to like take a quick bet i'm putting in 100 bucks and i want to take out 500 bucks is the aim within six months so of course you get those sort of customers but if you start to believe that that is going to be the sustainable aspect of the customer acquisition that's when i think you could fall over so of course we have no problem servicing whichever investor um you know, wants to come to the platform when we don't really pass judgment on how you should invest. But we still do have a viewpoint on who the core state customer is. And I think it's it's that aspect through that COVID period that has sort of solidified, um, you know, where we are now as a business continuing to grow going forward. And, and one way that you sort of essentially articulate that is, is through content. And I, I mm. think that the way that investing was articulated when I was sort of growing up in like 90s, 2000s was – it almost was like willfully boring. Like the, the yeah. big companies just, they kind of... Trying to keep you out. Yeah. Trying to keep a bit of confusion in the space. And and it, and because a lot of the... And it, and it didn't make... You know, there was the sort of the world of investing and then there was the world of consumption and mm. that they weren't... You didn't see that those things were linked. And I think that, you know, in recent weeks you've, you've written about like sunglasses and the way that basically every pair mm. of sunglasses actually ultimately ladders up to the, to the same company and mm. and even like very pop consumer brands like Levi's and and Hershey's and and you know not just the the fact that they exist but the sort of prospects of them and how these kind of mm. actually decades old iconic companies are navigating this much more uh, sort of fluid landscape how did you sort of hit upon that idea to use content to use media as a mm. sort of a fundamental bedrock of how you uh, uh you know interacted with your customers for sure so i think structurally or as a mechanic why content i think the first reason is that you know when you're a startup and as we were growing budgets aren't huge and you don't you can't just go and necessarily spend heaps of money to just acquire customers and so what that forces you to do is really focus on your existing customer base and go, look, if we can engage them really well, if we can create something that they absolutely love from a product and just a general brand experience perspective, they will go and advocate. And we saw in the early days, because we really tried to focus on that core customer, that word of mouth was a huge growth driver for us. And, and part of that strategy was, okay, well, how do we deliver content in a way that is different? As you spoke about, you know, typically it's, it's eye-wateringly dry. It's like heavily analytical which is great from the contents of that content, but it's not the way that this you know next generation want to consume media in any regard. So, as a mechanic, content was always a very important part of driving you know community engagement, and it's sort of maintained its role within that going forward. In terms of the actual uh, the direction or the the creative aspect of you know that idea of how do you in, embed some cultural nuances or, or cultural stories into 
the idea of your market or finance content. If I can go a bit deep for a second, the sort of where it, where it comes from is that investing has become a sort of a subculture in and of itself. So as you sort of spoke about earlier, it's like it used to be this thing that was just it was just a, fi- a transactional finance discipline that you sort of learned and people that did it did it in a very transactional way. What we've seen now as a result of this idea of, well, it's about it signals to the world that I am someone who is taking care of my own shit and I'm someone that's actually trying to progress myself forward, which is an aspirational sort of um, pursuit these days. They're like rise of the op- entrepreneur and people that are going out and making their own way is kind of culturally put on a pedestal. So having something that can sort of symbolize that or, or badge you as one of those types of people um, is something that then people like to go and display publicly. So investing is taken on this sort of subculture. Um, if you think about the way that people engage with music or fashion or, or whatever it is, there are WhatsApp groups, there's forums, there's memes, there's in-jokes, there's all these sort of things that beyond the core thing of it, which is in this case the investing, the transacting, the transactions of buying and selling shares, there's a whole world that you can go and explore and play with and socialise and all that sort of stuff. And we see that emerging and sort of burgeoning within the investing space. Like there are these Facebook groups, there's WhatsApp groups, people share content with each other, people share ideas. We even had a customer or a group of customers in New Zealand who set up a, a company and were investing sort of as a syndicate through a company. And each month they were allowing one of the one of the people in it to, to make the investment decisions. And obviously there was discussion through a WhatsApp group. And then at the end of the year, they would have um, the company, I won't say the company name that they had set up, but the lunch, like an end of year Christmas lunch for that group of people. And you kind of think of that, like, it's like very fantasy football-esque where you've sort of got this group and you're discussing um, ideas and sort of having a bit of banter. And then at the end of the year, you've got, you've got that lunch moment. We all come together as a group and celebrate. So we're sort of seeing that subculture forming and it's, and it's really kind of formed now, but it's continuing to form um, around investing. And so what that then creates is A, just the engagement style. So we knew that content and the brand experience needed to be cultural and sort of match the way that you know, the consumer was in, engaging with the category as a whole. And then secondly, what it also has resulted in is that people are now seeing the world through the lens of the markets. As they become more educated and they become more entrenched within thinking about investing, they're looking at, you know, a new iPhone coming out and they're going, oh, I wonder what the impact on Apple is going to be. Um, you know, the Barbie movie is a great example. Um, when, you know, there was such hype around the Barbie movie, we saw on the stake platform, Mattel become one of our most top traded stocks and it had basically never been really traded before that much. So you can sort of see this behavior of people are looking at what's going on in the world and they're sort of trying to work out and translate, well, how will that impact from a financial perspective or, or, or a stock price perspective? And then they're going and doing research around that. And if it's something that they believe in, they'll go and go and buy. So we sort of noticed this behavior emerging of going, well, it's this intersection between culture and the markets that is becoming, as you said, it's not so disparate anymore. They're actually, I mean, they never were disparate. It's just that people didn't really take that perspective. Um, But you're seeing that happen now. And so we found that sweet spot of going, okay, well, if we can have conversations about the markets, but through the lens of, you know, a cultural insight or a cultural happening or something that's just generally interesting or loved by people, they're going to be a very engaged by that, but B, it's also sort of matching the way that they are thinking about the markets and going and making their investment decisions. It's so interesting because it is like you know, it's a guy who grew up reading music magazines, mm. like, and and that that was that was my identity. It was it was how I sort of yeah. started to understand the world, and I think that it's weird, right? Like we're we're living in this sort of post monoculture era where there are you know. There's all these facilities to build community and all these um, sort of niches, but when it, because we live in this sort of very globalized uh, world at the same time, you know the mm. the fact that you know in, investing as a as a form of culture unto itself that that basically once you start to see the world and see the kind of rising and falling uh, of different elements within it as something that's ultimately kind of information that mm. can um, be processed into a, a sort of an investment decision. It, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to unsee it once you, once you get into that mindset. Absolutely. It's kind of like looking behind the curtain, you know, and as you get more experience, and it's not about getting, becoming a finance expert necessarily. Like people are certainly looking to upskill on, you know, investing strategies and, and, and read about company deep dives and all these sorts of things. But there's also just a broad, that, that broad lens that like once you sort of start to go, oh, that everything affects 
a share price. Like the market prices things in pretty instantaneously and based on all these little spikes or announcements or whatever that actually previously I just consumed as a consumer of the iPhone or as a consumer of movies and Barbie, I can now see that next layer down and I've sort of peeked behind the curtain. You kind of can't unsee it as you say. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. I mean, it's, and it's, it's interesting, right, because, you know, for example, you know, you know with, with the iPhone's a classic example, mm. like this is a a large purchase that you're making and you mm. can look at, you know, iPhones tend to run in, in clusters. Most of your friends probably have them. You look at the replacement cycle mm. of them. You think about what the impact of the USB-C versus the lightning change, yeah. what, how will that kind of yeah. flow out into people's behaviors? And then you can start to go, well, how, how will that impact the, the sort of device replacement cycle? So, mm. you know, you can almost like hedge alongside this actually quite hefty consumer Absolutely, um, purchase of your own, but even into like like I thought the the Barbenheimer phenomenon, particularly mm. the the fact that actually if you look through it into the that new strategy of Mattel, where he's basically like we're not a toy company, we're an IP company, yep, exactly. And, and there was a a lot of people were making fun of that dude a few years ago for, mm. and he'd been saying it for a little while and didn't actually yep. have a lot of things he could point at, mm. and so you know I do think that there is really something in the fact that. You, you can look through it into a kind of it's on some level it's corporate strategy but on another it's kind of these it's big established companies learning how to see the world the same way that the young insurgents did and, and kind of make changes mm. uh, as a result. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Barbie's a great example. I mean, it's got this asset in a very popular toy concept or, you know, doll um, and then it's got this huge brand attached to that. And as you say, they've completely repositioned from it's just the doll and it's just the toy to it's basically what the movie was, was the revival of the franchise. I was saying um, to someone a couple of months ago when it was all happening, I was like thinking forward to Halloween. I guarantee you there will be heaps of Barbies and heaps of Kens and whatever the other characters in the movie was. I haven't quite seen it yet. Um, But when was the last time that potentially the most common outfit for Halloween was Barbie? Probably not since like 1990. It almost felt unrevivable in some respects. Exactly. It felt it felt so kind of antiquated and yet now it feels yeah. like incredibly urgent and current. For sure. And I think they've obviously shifted the inclusivity aspect to it and, and modernized the way that it manifests and the concept of what a Barbie is. I think they've, they've yeah, done a, a pretty of good satire job and so on. Yeah. Of, of bringing that into 2023. But yeah, conceptually they've turned it from a toy into a franchise and you can you could see how theme parks could have Barbie rides and you can see how they can be consumer kits for whatever it is and, and dress ups for Halloween and all this sort of stuff. And really, I think the, the movie obviously has been the sort of the, the, the start point for that. But I would I would not be surprised to see them diversifying into a number of different ways where you go the Barbie brand and the engagement with that is is kind of the entity and, and it's the franchise that consumers will buy into across a number of different product lines. So thinking about, you know, other sort of moments over the past few years, are there, are there any other kind of things that stand out where you sort of started to see trading action on the platform, like a, a sort of mm. a sleepy stock just become incredibly widely held or, you know, and, and could link that up with phenomena? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, thing, anything that stands out in particular? Yeah, it happens all the time. So I think toward the end of last year, Man U, Manchester United was coming up for sale or the ownership is going to change and it's listed on the US market and obviously available to be traded on stake therefore. And we started to see just as that the different news cycles or the different announcements around that deal um, were coming out, that trading behavior was starting to match. And it's also interesting to look at the buy-sell ratio so you can sort of see how people are perceiving um, the stock, whether they're sort of holding it or whether they're getting rid of it. Um, but, you know, certainly just absolute trade volumes. Even when WrestleMania, I think, was on in January and I think came to New Zealand, 
we saw New Zealand investors sort of getting behind the WWF or WWE brand um, and stock. So all all these sorts of things, absolutely. That's so interesting. Yeah, and mm. and 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 again, like people are, can be fans of sports, and it, again, it's a mindset shift. Yeah. Realize, oh, actually. I've got this huge emotional investment mm. in this team, but I can actually make a, a tangible investment and and sit on this thing for years. If I really believe yeah. in UFC or uh, you know some other kind of you know former publicly traded stock, I can I can actually yeah make that real. And that's what's exciting about I think the Wall Street market and the U.S. market is that you know mostly these big global brands are listed there, and these companies that really are driving categories at, a, at, a, at the sort of leading level um, are available to be traded on the US market. I mean, Nike was a, is another interesting example. It's a bit of an older one now, but when that Last Dance documentary came out and it was on Netflix and it was all about Chicago Bulls through the 90s and Michael Jordan and obviously Nike being such an intrinsic part of that story, um, we saw, you know, Nike is a, a reasonably popularly traded stock, but we still saw volumes jump 35%. Um, and you can... It's interesting to watch the difference between the sort of flash in the pan moments and what investors actually believe are going to be seismic shifts or, or really positive sustained shifts to a business model. I mean, Barbie is a great example where we saw, you know, the share price actually move and share volume go because people are seeing that as, well, there's growth potential in, in, in that strategic shift versus, you know, something might generate some attention, but then with further research, it's actually not that attractive of an opportunity. So you sort of see those divergent behaviors happening as well. So thinking about New Zealand specifically, mm -hmm. you know, this country had a quite a different experience of the the pandemic to to um, maybe a bit more similar to Australia, but certainly other markets that you operate in um, have have hand, had a, a different ride. Whether that's the sort of inflation elements or the the sort of length and, and pace of the lockdowns and so on, have you seen are, are there sort of distinct elements to the way New Zealanders are using the platform that are that are sort of specific to us or is there really a globalised investing community and culture? Um, there's definitely nuances. I think what we're seeing in New Zealand in particular is that sort of through the COVID period there was much more of a beha behaviour around stock picking, like I'm going to pick Tesla and try to ride it up or there's a new EV out of China like a Neo or whatever it might be and that's a great opportunity. I see growth and everything was kind of a winner. <clears throat> back in back in those days. I think what we've now seen is obviously interest rates have gone up, inflation's going crazy, wage growth isn't really keeping up with inflation. Um, and I was actually looking at a spin-off article from 2021, um, which was comparing housing prices from 91 to 2021, sort of that 30-year period, and looking at, well, in 2021 dollars, what would your salary have to be to afford a house with 40% of your salary being going toward repayments or, or something to that effect? And essentially it's three to four times um, the amount in 2021 as in terms of nine versus 1991, how much you had to be earning just to make repayments. So A, there's the interest rates, which are a lot higher than they were during COVID, but I don't think they're broadly that high in terms of if you Historical look back on average. a 50 year average. Um, so it's not actually the interest rates themselves that's you know really making it difficult for people to get into the housing market. It's just the absolute price of things. And so that sort of wealth generation is seemingly very difficult and it's kind of seen as unaffordable. And then even just cost of living, like just groceries, like, you know, I've heard stories of people actually shipping groceries from Australia and paying the cost of, of freight and it's actually cheaper than going to the grocery store here. Um, so I think New Zealand in particular is, is very hit hard by, you know, cost of living in certain elements. Um, and certainly housing is a really strong or really expensive underlying factor. Um, so you sort of got all that and what that's resulting in is that people have started to see their primary wage as not really even sustainable to keep up, let alone get ahead. And as I, as I was speaking about earlier, there's this drive and this motivation to progress. Um, and so what we're sort of seeing is that people now really are looking at the stock market, not as just these sort of short term, let's pick a stock. They're looking at how do I really set up a portfolio that is about long term wealth generation. And so we're sort of seeing a bit of a shift or well, a lot of a shift into, you know, the primary portions of the portfolio there is still that stock picking behavior like people still want to have you know a bit of a, a crack if they believe in a certain stock or they see some you know outsized growth potential they still want to have a go at that but the lion's share of the portfolio for our new zealand customers is moving into you know etfs based around thematics so it might be you know um 
pharmaceuticals or it might be technology or it might be AI and robotics, you know, whatever it might be, they're going, okay, I have a long-term horizon here. So I'm going to get behind an ETF that sort of just tracks that over time, or it might be index ETF. So it might be, I just want to follow the S&P um, and the performance of that. So I, I believe the stock market will grow over my longer term horizons now, and I'm shifting into more of those passive assets that will just, they may not return me, you know, 200% in the next six months, but they will return me good gains over my 5, 10, 15 year horizon. So it seems that people are now looking at the stock market as a real wealth generation tool to sort of supplement the fact that primary wage is just not enough to to keep up, let alone get ahead. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that um, feels quite sort of fundamentally different about the way that generation is engaging with stock markets versus the you know, I've been reading recently about the 87 stock market crash and the the sort of mania that preceded it, which in New Zealand was on a global scale, you know, it was frothier and then the crash was mm. harder and, mm. and more sustained. And that had a, a real impact in terms of making people leery of markets mm. over the long term. Like I think our, our NZX50 hasn't recovered the losses from 1987, which is just mm. kind of a stunning it's uh, yeah. uh, fact. But... The, and I think as a result, there was a sort of a sense that greed was the underlying motivator that, mm. that fueled that might even have been true back then. But if you think about the dynamics of a person in their 30s now, the, that that track that you described right at the start, the get your degree, mm. get married, buy mm. a house kind of thing, it's just not nearly so obviously there. Mm. So, And yes, you have your KiwiSaver, but if you want to sort of generate wealth and if you sort of see that these structural shifts and kind of you know behavior and and uh markets are so, and so on are are really fundamental and there forever like it's i think it's it's a you know there's a real kind of rationale to saying mm. i want to you know build a portfolio that this that is my own thing that's sort of separate from yeah. that that i can sort of like tend to like a garden over long term and and not you know, I'll look at it all the time, but I'm not actually going to touch it yeah. in any profound way for potentially for decades. And I, you know, there's actually a, yeah, you know, that's quite a profound shift in in behaviour that I think a platform like yours manifests. Definitely, and I think you know, people. That's why you know we sort of offer the product that we do with you know the Wall Street offering because people are looking for diversification. So obviously, the NZX is an attractive market, and many investors do invest here. You know, New Zealand or Kiwi investors invest on the ASX as well, but it's it's about diversification and, and there's a lot of different opportunities that aren't accessible on the NZX or ASX on Wall Street. Um, but yeah, certainly I think people are sort of pruning these portfolios over time um, and, the, and, and the sense of control is a real primary driver. The idea that, you know, I can't necessarily trust the world to roll out the red carpet for me or all the building blocks to just get me anywhere that I want to go. It needs to be done by myself. And, you know, the markets present the opportunity, A, for supreme control because you get to buy and sell what you want and curate your portfolio as you perceive things. So if you perceive AI to be a fad, you don't go for it. If you perceive it to be a game-changing uh, technology that is just going to redefine how we live and how society operates, then you do invest in it. Um, so it's supreme control. And then it's also a lot more accessible. I mean, you know, on, on average, our investors' portfolio size is about $10,000 USD. Um, but you can, if you wanted to, invest from as little as $10. Um, but I guess the point being that you don't need these enormous deposits, you don't need these enormous capital outlays to just get started and to start building that wealth. And I think that sense of action that you can take with you know, a more accessible level of um, of, of funds or capital that you can sort of deploy into the markets versus into something like property, um, you can just get cracking right away. And I think that's that's attractive as well. Yeah, I think in this era of a sort of lot of distrust and, you know, like a, a sense of that, that institutions that you previously had relied on, mm. they, they just, they aren't necessarily offering you the same deal they might have yeah. offered your parents, that sense of agency that you can go and being this thing on your own terms and everything else, well, I hope it's true, but I, I don't necessarily believe it. Yeah, um, yeah, I can really see that. Hey, um, Brian, this has been so interesting and I've, I've kind of wanted to get into the sort of investing culture place for a while and this has been such a fun way to do it. Thanks. Great. Thanks, no, thanks, thanks for so much up. for having me. It's been great. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O-Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis.
Kia ora e te iwi, te ai he Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.